to the book of Romans chapter 12. I want to take time to express my appreciation to all of you and to all of our good ministering brethren. Praise the Lord to all you brethren. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You may be seated. I believe if somehow I could, I could relate this message the way that I feel that it should be, that it would be a prescription for revival. I really believe it. And so maybe that's the title I'll use here tonight. Prescription for revival is just simply this, striving to please God. Amen. Now, one translation says a living sacrifice which is pleasing to the Lord. I have, uh, I have striven all my life to please others. I have... I've here heard uh, different kinds of preachers and different things, and I wanted to please. I wanted to please. I, I just wanted to please people. But I woke up to the fact that there is really only one that we'd better strive to please, and that's God. And if somehow we can please God, everything else will turn out all right. And that's what I want to do in this message tonight is do my best to inspire you to want to please the Lord. I, uh, <clears throat> just this past Sunday, completed 25 years of pastoral ministry in Life Tabernacle, Houston, Texas. This coming Sunday, we, they are having a special celebration for <clears throat> the 25 years of service that we have uh, tried to give there. And I cannot help but remember 25 years ago when three fine men of that assembly that had been a part of electing me as pastor brought a gold-plated key with a little tag on it to the pastor of Life Tabernacle. 25 years ago, this coming Sunday, I held it up for the first time. I said, now... I appreciate this little gift. I know that somebody wanted me to feel good, gave me a gold-plated key. I said, I have no doubt but that it will unlock the door to this building. I have not tried it. I don't think that I ever will, but I have no doubt. I feel like that it will. But I said, what we need for Houston, Texas, for this church is more than a gold-plated key. We've got to find the key of revival that will unlock the door, unlock the heart of God that would bring men and women to a knowledge of this glorious truth that we love and hold so dearly in our hearts. I'm happy that I could stand here tonight and tell you that God has helped us. I don't claim that we are highly successful, but I do know that God has blessed our efforts and that we have a great people there that love God and that have worked so faithfully. And I told them, I said, I, I'm sort of sensitive to spirits. And I said, I, I just sort of feel like that everybody here uh, still uh, loves me and wants me to be their pastor. I said, in fact, if we took a vote of confidence today to see if you wanted me, I know it would be a hundred percent. I said, however, I'm not going to let you do that. <clears throat> but I know one thing. I know that it's the will of God for every church to have revival. Yes, I know it's the will of God for the states to have revival. Yes, I know it's the will of God for Canada to have revival. Yes, and I love Canada. I'll tell you, I, I just thrill every time Brother Urshan tells me that I'm going to get to come up this way for a conference. I I enjoy it so much. I love the people here. I, I love the worship. I, 
I like the conservative attitude that I feel in the land, and I like it in the church, and I appreciate my brothers and sisters in Christ here. What we need more than anything else in this world is an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival. The best prescription I have is just live to please God and somewhere down the line it will happen. It will happen. God's Word declares that it will. Now there was a special plan that God had in the Old Testament. Uh, he instituted the sacrificial offerings, and uh, this was God's way. For a man to please God, he had to come to the altar of God and meet God there with either a ram or a lamb or an oxen or with a goat or a turtle dove. It represented something dying and blood being shed. And furthermore, the requirement was not just an oxen or just a lamb or a ram or a sheep. It was the very best of the flock that you have. Amen. Don't bring any scraggly old creature to my altar and accept, expect me to accept it and be pleased. It's got to be something special. I'm telling you, if that priest stood at the altar and he saw somebody bringing a lamb that was crippled, that man would be condemned on the spot and sent back home. Men through the years learned to operate without really obeying God, and they became careless in their worship. And you have but to read the book of Malachi to see what careless living they had drifted into. Religion had become formal. Religion had become a duty. It had become an obligation. It was no longer a joyful time, a man meeting God, and so... They begin to substitute God's way for their own way. God's plan was if a man's going to bring an offering, he must bring it with him, lead it across the country. However far it was, you bring it with you. But the priest had corrupted the worship and the sacrificial system to the extent that a man could wait till he got to the tabernacle and buy his sacrifice there and to pay whatever price he wanted to pay. And there was always an old animal around there. And God said, you've polluted my altar. And, and he said, why don't you offer what you're giving me to your governor? See if he'd be pleased with it. See if he would accept it. And he said, uh, you know that he would not. Then why would you offer something polluted? In other words, God was saying, you're giving me the leftovers. You're giving me what you can't use. You think, uh, well, God will be pleased with it. I don't have any use for it. It won't do me any good. My family, I'll just give it to God. And it was just a leftover offering. A leftover offering. Giving God the leftovers. Giving God that that they could not use for themselves. Do you see what I'm talking about tonight? Amen. We must never get in a clear, in a careless condition like Israel got themselves into and feel like we can please God by giving God what's left over. Take the best for ourselves and enjoy everything for ourselves and that that we have left over. If we happen to have a little bit more, then we will bring it to the Lord. God would never be pleased with leftovers. I came from a large family. There were ten children. Eight lived to be grown. Mother and dad were faithful pioneering soldiers of the cross, carried their family with them across the country, and built fifteen churches, baptized thousands in Jesus' name. A great preacher, a pioneering preacher. <clears throat> I uh, changed schools as high as eight times in one year. In those days, the, the evangelist took his family with him everywhere he went. We uh, slept by the side of the road. We slept in automobiles. We slept under a tent. We slept in empty church houses. We slept under every condition. My mother was a champion at making the best of every situation. She never, ever complained about anything. I don't ever, ever remember her ever criticizing anybody. 
and she would never allow us to. She would never allow us to find fault with anything. She never did. She was a beautiful example. So was my wonderful dad. And uh, I grew up uh, in that kind of an atmosphere. And regardless of what the circumstances were, mother knew how to prepare food for whoever was there, however many was there. Many times there were two or three gospel workers and... That's why I never learned to like fried chicken. They said, every preacher likes fried chicken. I said, this one doesn't. Because by the time I got to the table, all that was left was the neck and the wing and the back. <laughs> so uh, I never did learn to like the leftovers. Mother knew how to fix a meal that would go over whatever was there and take care of them. And there was never anything left over. Every meal I sat down to was a hot meal. Whatever it was, if it was just cornbread and beans, we ate everything that was set before us. And I never did learn to like leftovers. Well, there are a lot of people who are satisfied with leftovers, but God is not. And if ever a time in our lives we should strive to please God and give Him our very best, I contend it is the very hour in which we live right now. We have churches across the country because somebody gave God the best. I was in Venezuela recently and I was surprised and shocked at what I saw. Brother Burton had gone in there years ago, 20 some years ago, and began to labor. And there were only three or four little churches at that time. And when I was there, they have 200 churches now, and in the conference, over 5,000 people. What a wonderful, what a wonderful revival has taken place there. Brother Burton's a tall, dignified, low-keyed type person, and you'd think, well, uh, there wouldn't be much of a revival come from an individual like that, but God doesn't look like we look. He doesn't see like we see. He knows how to work through a heart that is perfect toward Him. And He knows how to make a perfect heart. I saw one of the greatest revivals and I thought, oh Lord, we've got a church right here in Venezuela that's going to rise to meet you in the air. We ought to strain and strive to please God, not give Him that that's left over, but give Him our very best. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And after we've done all that, that that's just our reasonable service. We don't have anything to boast about or brag about. So what if you have 2,000 in church? We still don't have anything to boast about. If we give 100,000 a year to foreign missions, we still don't have anything to boast about. So what if you don't have room on your parking lot? We still don't have anything to brag about. So what if it's wall-to-wall -wall people? We cannot claim any glory for ourselves. It's God that does the work. It's God that does the work. Hallelujah. And that's only our reasonable service when we have done all of that. Praise the Lord. Amen. It was when that little widow woman gave that last handful of meal that revival came to Israel because she fed a prophet that went upon the top of Mount Carmel that was able to cause fire to come down from heaven and turn the hearts of God's people back in another direction. He went into the town there hungry after having fasted a long time and she was picking up sticks and he said to her, I'm hungry, would you prepare me a meal? She said, I'm just now getting sticks together and I have nothing left but a handful of meal. I'm going to prepare that for my son and we're going to eat it and that's all there is. There's nothing left in the house. I'm telling you, Prophet Elijah, that's all there is. Well, ordinarily we'd think a good prophet of God would stand back and say, All right, you go ahead and eat that, and then uh, what's left over, I'll take what's left. But he said, I want you to go and prepare that cake and bring it to me. 
And he sat there and ate it in front of that widow woman and her son. And when he got through eating, he said, Now I want you to prepare for yourself and your boy. She said, uh, Oh, Prophet Elijah, it's all gone. I, I just scraped the bottom of the barrel. I turned it upside down and I patted it on the sides and on the bottom. And I made sure I got it all. He said, You go look again. Amen. And when she went and looked again, lo, there was another handful of meal. She ate and they got up the next morning and he said, I'm hungry. Is there anything to eat? No, I'm sure I got it all the next, that, uh, that, that last time. He said, you go look again. And there was still a handful of meal in the barrel. And that went on for three years. Every time she went to the meal barrel, there was still a handful of meal. I'm telling you, you cannot outgive God if we'll dare to give God our best. And I know, I know we're going through depressed times. And I know that many of you are suffering. You've lost your jobs and, and the, the bills are coming due and the house payment. And you're wondering what's going to happen if you continue to give your best to God. Somehow when you go back to the meal barrel, there'll still be a handful of meal. Because God has a way of taking care of things. And he makes a way when it seems there is no way. Hallelujah. Praise God. I imagine every morning there was an invisible pipeline connected to that barrel that reached all the way to the throne of grace. And the Lord God told an angel every morning, you get another handful of meal and drop it in that invisible pipeline. It got into that barrel. How it got there, I don't know. But that little woman learned to trust God and by giving her very best, uh, not the leftovers, God gave the very very best to her. Same thing happened to the little woman with the pot of oil. She just had a pot of oil in the house. That's all. She was commanded and her sons to go out in the neighborhood and collect all the vessels. Got in the house and shut the door and Elisha said, start pouring out now. She started pouring from that one little pot of oil. God allowed it to fill two pots and three pots and four vessels and ten vessels and twenty vessels, however many was in the house. And when the finally the last vessel was full, God said, that's enough. And the oil stayed. But the need was supplied. Amen. I'm here to tell you tonight that if we'd be willing like those two little widow women to give our best to God, God will give his best to us. It was when the woman broke the alabaster box of ointment that represented one full year's of wages that the whole house was full of a sweet odor and God was pleased. Obviously, those around her was not, around him was not pleased. They complained about it. Why wasn't this sold and give to the poor? Amen. Jesus said, you don't have, you don't have me with you always. Be willing as long as I'm in your presence to give me everything that you have. And oh friend, if we can learn that secret. If I can learn all over again what Paul meant. To present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. I know that that will be a reasonable service and God will pronounce his blessing upon it. Amen. And so if you're doing it, just keep on doing it. If you want revival, just keep on doing it. Strive to please God. Be like Enoch of old. The Bible said, by faith Enoch walked with God and he was not because God took him. But before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. I found out you don't have to have a whole chapter written about you to please God. You don't have to have a whole book that has your name on it to please God. You don't have to have a long list of accomplishment by your life to please God. You can wrap everything up that Enoch did in about six short verses. But he so pleased the Lord. The Lord said, I'm going to take you with me, Enoch. And he walked with God and all of a sudden he was not because God took him. You'll have that kind of a testimony. 
I can promise you that we'll please the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And he lived in a day much like our day. It was just before the flood. It was just before God poured His wrath out upon the world. It was like it was in the days of Noah. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. But here's a man by the name of Enoch who walks through the middle of all of that corrupted world. He will not allow the world to squeeze him into its mold. One translation of he, uh, Romans 12 and 2 says, Do not let the world squeeze you into its mold, but be remolded from within. Let the power of the Holy Spirit so remold and remake your life and reshape your life that there is no way you could ever fit into the mold that this world has. And it's pressing them in, friend. Don't you ever forget it. It has a mold. And along comes religions and they're just pressed right into the mold and they come out looking like the rest. Everybody looks just alike. But I'm here to tell you there's a group of people in this world tonight Brother Cooling quoted the scripture that is a royal priesthood a chosen generation. They are not going to be squeezed into anybody's mold. They're going to be remolded from within. They're going to love holiness and separation and they will not be ashamed of the mark that they bear in this world. On every side they were pressing against Enoch. But he refused to let that world that was anti-God and anti-righteousness get hold of him. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make up my mind to walk with God. I don't care what everybody does around me. There's only one person that I want to please, and that's Almighty God. And I made this please my generation all around me and pleasing God, but it doesn't make any difference. I am determined that I'm going to please the Lord. And because of that, God took him out of this world. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For behold, I am the Lord, and I dwell in the midst of my people, a people who love me, and a people who serve me with joy and gladness. And I say unto my people this night, do not be ashamed, do not be downcast, but look up and rejoice, look up and believe the Lord your God, for I am the Lord in the midst of my people. Rejoice in the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Sometime or another in our minds, we have to make up our minds. We've got to make up our minds that we live in a world that's anti-God. Anti-righteousness. Anti-right living. My lifestyle is going to be different. I am determined not to be a part of it. And the pressure of the world and charismatics and everything else says, Be a part. Be a part. Be a part. Be a part. Who are we trying to please? The religious world or Almighty God? We'd better strive to please God. And if somehow we can please Him, I can promise you that everything's going to turn out all right. And we're going to be a part of revival. A revival of the name of Jesus in these last days, if you please. Don't you think the Lord's quit loving this gospel? Paul loved it and he protected, he protected the church against himself. He really did. He said, if I come back preaching something else to you, then I, that message I delivered to you, or if an angel comes, let him be a curse. Amen. Amen. He said, I better not come back trying to preach anything else. I'm glad that United Pentecostal Church still preaches this gospel. I'm glad that we still love it. Amen. 
I know that it still takes repentance. Water baptism in Jesus' name. That name that's greater than all the powers of darkness. That name that's above every name. That the, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that, that Jesus Christ is Lord. It still takes that name. And it still takes that miraculous infilling of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. With the evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. That's still the message of salvation. And after that, walking uprightly, walking uprightly, working righteousness, speaking the truth in your heart, backbiting not with your lips, not taking up a reproach against a neighbor. Amen. It better not be that when we meet together that we greet each other and say, have you heard the latest? No, no. We'd better be like those old pioneers when they got together. It was a praise and it was a love and it was a worship. Thank God when they got together, it was dangerous even to go to the to the dinner table because they'd start to pray over the food and a spirit of prayer get a hold of them. First thing you know, they push the chairs back from the table. They're down on their faces waiting upon God. They had one desire, one thought, one aim, one goal, one ambition. And that was to please God. Hallelujah. No wonder the power of God would fall and the place would be shaken. And you talk about running. If you run and knock people down, you're not in the spirit. If you shout and you knock people around, you're not in the spirit. When you're in the spirit, you can shout and run and dance and it'll be a beautiful dance and run to the Lord. I can remember the power of God getting hold of some people and they had fall down and there may have been children lying on a pallet, but the spirit of God would just move their bodies over and lay them gently down on the ground. Amen. And those old fashioned meetings, I'm telling you the power and presence of God was great. There was no form or fashion. Just plain old spirit filled. There was no ripples or reels. Oh friend. But there was a mighty power. And when the preacher sounded out. That, that certain note of preaching the gospel. Something happened. People were shaken. Men were stirred. And the power of God fell. It was because they strived. With everything that was in them. To please God. You want revival? Let's please God. Quit trying to please everybody around you and start trying to please God. Amen. Hallelujah. You can start making rules and we'll be here from now till Thursday night making rules that we want everybody to live by. But I'm here to declare until you we're here tonight not to make rules, but we're here to strive to please God. If somehow our lives can be complete and we can please Him, that's the most important thing. Then revival will sweep this country from one coast to the other. The old prophet Hosea, 10th chapter, verse 12, says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Sow in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up the fouler ground of your heart. For it is time to seek the Lord until He come and rain righteousness upon us. Hosea was talking to a nation of farmers. They knew what the ground was. They knew when it was fallow. Fallow ground was ground that had been broken in times past. But it's lying fallow now. It hadn't been broken in a long time. The rain had fallen upon it. The thorns and the thistles were growing. Land that one time produced great results vegetation, a lot of good things. Now it's fallow ground. And the writer, the prophet said, don't you know, Israel, that it's time to break up that fallow ground? But he said, I don't want to be disturbed. I can stand here tonight and say truthfully to all of you, 
that I have never heard a message in my life that ever made me mad or angry. I thank God for my love for the Word of God. Amen. I've never heard a message that I went away and criticized and found fault with because I love the Word of God. I've heard a lot of messages that made me feel awfully uncomfortable. I may have heard some that made me want to pray. I've heard some that made me want to crawl on my hands and knees to get to an altar. But I've never heard any that made me angry. Because I love the Word of God. If somebody will just preach to me, I'll be better. If somebody will just open this book and tell me something and break up this old pile of ground, I know that I'll be the preacher that I need to be. A lot of times I have to put a sign on my door and my, on my office, do not disturb because I need some time alone with God. And I know that there are times that people would like to get to me, but I also know if I'm going to hear from the Lord, I have to withdraw from everything and not be disturbed. But if we're not careful, we'll hang a sign around our necks and we'll have do not disturb. I like me like I am. Don't tell me anything else that I need to do. Don't disturb me. I've got my church and I'm fat and satisfied. And I don't need anything else. The truth of the matter is we need a whole lot of things. Poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. We need somebody to disturb us. Don't have the attitude that I don't want anybody to disturb me. Don't preach something that will disturb me. Oh, yes. Disturb me, please. Disturb me, please. Because if I can ever get this pile of ground broken here, I know that revival will come. I know that revival will come if somehow I can get so disturbed. And if you're too busy to pray, and if you're too formal to shout, and if you're too dignified to cry, it's a pretty good sign you need to be disturbed. You need to somebody to shake you. You need somebody to awaken you. You need somebody to take you by the hand and say, come on, come on. We've got to go with God. Amen. Amen. Preach to me. Disturb me. I like it when I can feel like something's going to explode in me. I've been on the edge of my seat waiting for the altar call. I wanted to pray. I wanted to seek God. And the Bible said it is time to seek the Lord until. How long will it take? I don't know until you please God. Seek the Lord until. Seek the Lord until we get out of our dignified state. Seek the Lord until we can love one another. Oh, if we could fill the baptistry in Sussex. And if we could ever one of us be baptized in it all over again. With the baptism of love for one another. And all the gossipers could get baptized. And all the complainers get baptized. And all the fault finders get baptized. And all the criticizers get baptized. I'm telling you, we'd be on our road to pleasing God. God, and the revival would come that would shake our lives if you please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need to seek God for reality. I'm sick and tired of, I guess, being sick and tired. I've said so much, I'm sick and tired. I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. I want reality. First of all, I want to be real. If ever a time in my life I want to be real, it is now. I could not stand here tonight and tell you that I had been a perfect person, not by a long shot. I have failed God. I've missed the mark. I feel like there's been times I've been a hypocrite. I've been a pretender. 
But you're looking at a preacher tonight that made up his mind a few weeks ago. I want to be real. I want to be genuine. I want to be one that God can count on. I want to be one that God is pleased with. I don't care what people think or say. I want the approval of God. I want His blessing more than anything else in the world. Hallelujah. Seek God for reality. Not for a program, but for reality. Not for form and fashion, but for reality. Oh, if ever a time we needed reality, we need it now. Too much of the time our sermons are dead. Too much of the time our singing is dead. Too much of the time our programs are, are formal and dry and dead. But oh, we need a fresh touch from God. We need a fresh anointing. Of the Holy Ghost. We need to make up our minds. I'm going to please the Lord. I'm going to please the Lord. I don't care if my neighbor don't like it. I'm going to please the Lord. I don't care if it's not the end thing of the day. I'm going to please the Lord. I don't care if it's not popular. I'm going to please the Lord. I don't care what people think. I'm going to please God. That's the most important thing. Hallelujah. And I believe in a balanced life. And I believe that the church should be balanced. And we need to search the scriptures daily to make sure that we are balanced. You can have a lot of zeal and no knowledge. And you can also have a lot of knowledge and no zeal. Amen. It's beautiful when zeal and knowledge is well balanced. You talk about a church operating effectively when there's the proper amount of zeal and the proper amount of knowledge. Amen. You can have talent without character. I've seen some folks sing. They could tickle your ears while they were singing. But that's about all that it amounted to. I'm glad that God didn't choose by the foolishness of singing to save those that believe. Because there's been more jealousy over singing and music, I guess, than anything else. And that jealousy started with the master musician, Lucifer, the son of the morning, when he led that heavenly choir. And they were giving glory to God, and he thought he ought to be getting some of it. Jealousy was born in his heart. He was cast out of heaven. Ever since that time, there's been jealousy here and there. I like singing like I heard tonight where you minister, minister to the Lord. Praise God. No wonder the requirement for that Levitical choir was so stiff. Did you know you couldn't even sing in the Levitical choir without practicing five years? Can you imagine what it must have been like to go through a practice session five long years just to get into the Levitical choir? They had to have every note just right. They had to look just right. And they had to do it for the glory of God. Amen. 288 pieces in the orchestra that played in the temple on festival days and... There were 24 bands of 12 pieces in each band. They played according to their course. They would go to the temple and play their music. And when that band finished its course, there was another band of 12 instruments that moved in and kept pray, playing and kept singing. And on great festival days, those Levitical choirs would chant the praises of God back and forth to each other. That must have been beautiful, but you had to practice for five years to know how to sing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen. Thank God. Singing is beautiful when it's anointed of the Holy Ghost. Preaching is good when it's anointed of the Lord. And I've preached too many sermons that wasn't anointed. I've preached too many but I prayed when Brother Reynolds said tonight he wanted me to minister. I said, Lord, let me do just that. Don't let me just preach. I'd like to be able to minister. 
But I know one thing, to minister, I've got to die a little more, and I've got to get behind the cross a little more, and I've got to think mighty little of myself, and I've got to count him as Lord of Lord and King of Kings, and he's got to be everything. Amen. God help us. I want to please God. I want to please God. Oh, let me tell you folks in Canada here tonight, in the United States, wherever it is, if somehow we can please the Lord, then we can see the results we need to see. Micah asked the question, Where shall I come before His presence and what shall I give to the Lord? The answer came back. This is what the Lord requires of you. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Do justly. I can't, you know, I cannot mistreat my fellow man and do justly in the sight of God. And oh God, I'd better love mercy. You never know when you're going to need mercy. We have a school in our church, 12 grades, about 300 fine children and young people. One young man failed God, and I had to dismiss him from school. And So he came back by way of the altar. I watched him for two weeks. Every time service, he's right there, praying, crying, the last one around the altars. So I met with the school committee last night. He, uh, his mother, who is a Baptist woman, called. His brother, who is a school teacher for a public school there, called and said, if you just let my brother come back to school, you'll see something different. I said, well, I'm certainly merciful. I'm willing to give him another chance. <clears throat> I talked to our committee about it. One man disappointed me. He was hard, and he said, I don't believe he deserves another chance. I said, that's because you don't have the heart that the pastor has. I said, I'm the one that watched him pray and was the last one in the altar the last two weeks. And I said, who knows, the day may come. I may need a little mercy, too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put my arm around that boy later last night. I said, son, are you willing to do anything we require of you? He hugged my neck and said, pastor, I'll do anything you tell me to do. Praise God. Love mercy. I want to please God by being merciful. Now, if you want to have a hard driving spirit, you go ahead. You help yourself. You push everybody out of your path that gets in front of you. You don't just don't regard anything and you be number one and you go ahead through life like that. But I can promise you down the line somewhere, sometime, you're going to need some mercy. I'm glad we serve a merciful God. Where would we be tonight if he was not merciful? He had compassion on me. Touch my eyes, now I see. Heal my feet, now I walk in His way. Oh God, help me to show mercy. Help me to have a hand that can reach down to somebody. We've got too many that have that elder son spirit. When the prodigal son comes back home and the little attention is given, and he stands over to the side and says, Nobody ever gave me that kind of attention. Nobody ever made over me. Look at everybody getting around him, making over him. Amen. Father said, son, said, don't you know everything that I have? It's always been yours. Why should I have to give you special attention? God doesn't have to give any of us any special attention. He doesn't owe us anything. 
God, help us to have mercy in our heart enough. When we see a backslider coming down those aisles, we can weep all over again. We can say that son that was lost, he's finally found his way back home. And let it be a time of rejoicing. Oh, God, give us mercy. Help us to show mercy to somebody that is in need. And then help us to walk humbly before our God. I don't have anything to boast about tonight. Nothing. All I ever knew as a boy growing up was sacrifice. That was the order of the day. Every dime my dad got, it went right back into the work of God. I've sat on the platform, and I played the banjo, and I feet, my feet wouldn't even touch the floor, and I'd hide my head behind that big old head of the banjo, and I would cry a lot of times when I'd see him give his last dollar. I didn't understand then that the heart of that man of God loved souls, and he loved the work of God more than he loved his own life. I feel embarrassed when I'm called on to preach on special occasions. I don't deserve it and I'm not worthy of it. And that's not a false humility. I'm sincere when I say that. My dad never was called on to preach at a camp meeting or a camp meeting or a convention. The last one before he died, we were traveling together and we'd stopped along the road to get a bite to eat. I said, Dad, I wish you were preaching at this conference. He said, well, son, said, if they would call on me, I have a message. He said, I've always got a message. But he said, I've never been called on. And he said, it doesn't really matter. He said, I just hope the Lord will let me get smaller and smaller. He said, I know that I'm nothing. Here's a man that probably had baptized more than anybody that preached at the conference that year, or maybe more than all put together, and built more churches than all of them put together. But he said, I want the Lord to make me smaller and smaller. What does the Lord require of thee? Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Walk humbly. We have nothing to boast ourselves about tonight. We're just a humble people. God laid his hand upon us. We would have never known each other had it not been for the love of God. I appreciate my brethren here on the platform. I would have never known any of you, brethren, had it not been for the love of God. Because God loved me. Now my love reaches out to you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's be that humble people in this last day that God wants us to be. Worship the Lord with me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Bless your worthy name, Lord. Help us to do thy will, O oh God. Talk to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please? If you're satisfied with yourself and you don't want anybody disturbing you, then perhaps we will never please God the way we need or never have the revival. But if somehow in our hearts we're not satisfied with ourselves, and we're praying, oh God, make me what I ought to be. Make me and give me that perfect heart. I feel like revival, the seed of revival will be born right here in this convention. And we'll hear results in the years to come. I did not call you because you were great. I called you because you were hungry. And I saw a heart that was reaching and a heart that was hungry for more. And I am the same God that called you in the beginning. And I call you this very night. I call you again to humble yourself under the mighty hand of the almighty God. 
and he will exalt you in due season. Humble yourselves before your maker. Yield yourself and humble yourself to one another. The Lord thy God will be pleased with your humility. Praise God. Praise God. Let's feel after the Lord a little bit. Let's feel after him. He's not far from us.